And we turn now to the United States, which, of course, is gearing up for its own chaotic political race while Donald Trump wears his MAGA hat. Democratic presidential candidate Andrew Young wears a hat that says math. The former tech executive is an unabashed numbers lover who calls his campaign the nerdiest in history. Born in New York to Taiwanese parents, Yang's story is unique in a crowded democratic field. But can he pull away from that pack? Hari Srinivasan tries to find out. Why are you running for president? Uh, I'm running for president to try and solve the problems that got Donald Trump elected in 2016. And the most direct cause of his victory was that we'd automated away 4 million manufacturing jobs in Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Missouri, and Iowa. And if that list of states sounds familiar, those are all the swing states he needed to win. And now my friends in technology know that what we did to the manufacturing workers, we will now do to the retail workers, the call center workers, the fast food workers, the truck drivers, and on and on through the economy. We're in the midst of the greatest economic transformation in the history of the country, what experts are calling the fourth industrial revolution. And I'm running for president to wake America up to the fact that it is not immigrants that are causing dislocations around the country. It is uh, technology and an evolving economy, and then enacting meaningful solutions that will help America transition through this time. Somebody's going to say, why not start it? I don't know, mayor, work your way up? Well, unfortunately, we're, we're way behind the curve. We don't have that much time. Uh, and they, uh, if you look at the numbers now, 30% of malls and stores are closing in the next four years uh, because Amazon's soaking up $20 billion in business every year. Uh, and being a retail cashier is the number one job in the economy. Being a trucker is the most common job in 29 states. And robot trucks are five to 10 years away. So if I bided my time and ran for mayor, uh, you know, all, many of these challenges would get far, far ahead of us if, if they aren't already ahead of us already. You know, uh, former Vice President Biden uh, was recently making a speech the other day, which says the first priority has to be to beat Donald Trump. And you have said multiple times, I'm the candidate to beat Donald Trump because I am laser focused on the problems that got him elected in the first place. But I'm his opposite. What I am saying is that the opposite of Donald Trump is an Asian man who likes math. Is it really that simple? Uh, it may well be that simple. <laughs> uh, but I'm already drawing thousands of Trump supporters, independents, libertarians, conservatives. Someone in Iowa came up to me and said, you're what I hoped for when I voted for Donald Trump. Think about that for a second. Uh, and of course, I'm drawing many Democrats and progressives who are excited about the fact that we can put resource into the hands of uh, families and children and start recognizing uh, the work that women in particular do in our families and communities every day. So I'm getting Americans from every point in the political spectrum, including the 25 percent who are politically disengaged. Uh, and because of this, I can build a much bigger, broader coalition to beat Donald Trump in 2020. Did you or, take some inspiration from the idea that an outsider could do this? Well, certainly I would never be running for president if Donald Trump had not won in 2016. Uh, to me, his election was a giant red flag uh, to the progress of our country, where if you, you have to take a step back and say tens of millions of Americans were uh, desperate enough to take a bet on a narcissist reality TV star um, as our president. So that, to me, should be a stop sign for Americans in many uh, walks of life. It was for me. And I said, OK, how did this happen? We'd automated away millions of manufacturing jobs in the swing states, scapegoated immigrants. What are we going to do about it? This was uh, not a conversation I was seeing being had uh, in our political circles. And so I said, this is why I'm going to run for president. So in a way, Trump definitely inspired me to run. You know, in some ways, you're also stacking certain lobbies against you. When you look at some of these policy proposals, you want to create a department of attention economy to help us study technology like smartphones, how they might be harming us, and uh, regulate companies, apps, games, social media. Uh, you want to create, on a cabinet level, secretary of the Department of Technology. You want to regulate AI and emerging technology. Uh, you got the VAT tax. Those seem like government overreach to a tech industry that's largely gone unregulated. You want everyone to be automatically able to e-file their taxes, sort Don't of reversing believe. it, right? Yeah, seriously. Right? You have so, better things to do than yeah. and then, so, tax experts. And I can see it, you know, Intuit and HR Block lining up against you there. You want to make economic crimes punishable, so you want to hold uh, the financial companies to account. Um, I can see bankers and CEOs that want to fund your opponents just based on that single policy, right? All of these different smaller constituencies have become very powerful lobbying groups. <laughs> it over sounds, time. Like, sounds like you've been in DC. <laughs> no, no, no. But I, it's unfortunately that's that's kind of part of the the the, uh, the reason that we have this sclerosis that we have is how do you change that kind of a system that keeps people who are speaking 
your truth from actually getting the votes necessary. Well, I've raised millions of dollars from everyday Americans around the country in increments of only $19 each. Uh, so my fans are even cheaper than Bernie's. Um, so, you know, if, you're get, uh, if you get the people on your side, then you can win um, uh, an election in a democracy. But it is not as cut and dry as saying, oh, these people are going to, to be for me or against me. There are over 100 technologists and CEOs who've come out and endorsed my candidacy. Because if you sit with them and say, hey, are you concerned about the future? A lot of yeah. them are. Like, a lot of them are not bad people, and they're not even solely economically motivated. They're parents, they're Americans, they grew up in the Midwest. Yeah. And if you say, we need to come together and create a system that works well for everyone, uh, there are a lot of CEOs that will embrace that. You know, you know the biggest policy that uh, you, you are arguing for, universal basic income, which would put 1000 bucks into the hands of every citizen every month, Pretty much no questions asked. You're calling it the freedom dividend because it polls better with Republicans that way. Yes. Um, uh, now, Republicans might just come back and say this is just, you know, another socialist uh, redistribution plan. Uh, how do you think it's going to work and how do we pay for it? Well, I'll start with how to pay for it. So even conservatives do not like the fact that Amazon, a trillion dollar tech company, paid zero in federal taxes last year. They know that's uh, not the way our system should be designed. And so the way we pay for a freedom dividend for every American is we follow every other advanced economy in the world and have a value added tax. Mm -hmm. And because America's economy is up to a record 20 trillion plus, up 5 trillion in the last 12 years, even a mild value added tax would generate 800 billion in new revenue. That plus economic growth from having all this consumer buying power in Americans' hands, lower direct costs on things like incarceration and homelessness services and emergency room health care, and then the value gains from having a stronger, healthier, better educated population would be enough to pay for a dividend of $1,000 a month. This is the trickle up economy from people, families, and communities up. In terms of conservatives and their uh, either uh, excitement or lack thereof for this proposal, there's one state in the U.S. that has a dividend right now, and that state is Alaska, and it was passed by a Republican governor, deep red state, and it's wildly popular. Many conservatives and libertarians and independents really like the idea of a dividend because it puts more decision making into their hands as opposed to the government. Look, value added tax, uh, there's going to be people that's, uh, right now, anytime you hear a word of tax, uh, conservatives or Republicans, fiscal conservatives will come out and say, this is a job killer, right? And if you say you want to tax companies like Amazon, they're shareholders that penalize those companies. So how do you get over those two big hurdles? Well, I addressed 70 CEOs at a conference recently uh, here in New York, and I asked how many of them are looking at using AI to displace like thousands of back office workers. Every single hand went up. So then when you ask them, hey, do you think it's reasonable to have some sort of uh, measure so that the American people have a path forward, uh, it's not uh, unanimous, but it's about 50-50. Like many reasonable CEOs look up and say, you know what, my incentives in my position are to maximize profitability on a quarterly basis, which means if someone has this AI solution that enables me to get rid of workers, mm -hmm. I have to take it. So they see their own incentives and they see that it's going to be disastrous for many American workers. And many of them are very open to different sorts of solutions for the broader population. So 12,000 bucks a year, that's still below the poverty line. That's not enough to survive on. So does that mean that people, let's say they're pursuing the things that do make them happy uh, versus slogging through some horrible job? Does that mean that they pick up more part-time work, that our kind of economic overall productivity decreases, or that perhaps wages decrease, considering the market says, well, maybe I don't need to pay everybody so much because they have 12000 coming in, or prices increase a little bit, saying that bag of chips can go up another couple of cents because everybody has this in their pockets? Well, the first thing it does is it just puts more uh, money into the economy. It would grow the consumer economy by about 12%. It would create at least 2 million new jobs right in Main Street communities uh, where people can actually need the jobs instead of thinking someone's going to you know, move to Seattle or something. So there's just more work to be done uh, when people have more buying power. Um, and it would also help recognize a lot of the work that's done in, in families and homes and communities every day. Most of it's done by women. People like my wife who's at home with our two boys, one of whom is autistic. Uh, right now the market values her work at zero, GDP would value her work at zero. Uh, but we know that's the opposite of the, of the truth, that her work is as important and challenging as any other work that's being done. So uh, this 
uh, would actually make us more productive in many ways because it would free people up to do the kind of work that they want to do, much of which might not be um, showing up in GDP, which in my view is a very flawed and incomplete measurement. You've got a bunch of different proposals on your site um, besides universal basic income, so I want to get to a couple of those. Um, you, know, you, you call for 100 prosperity dollars for every American they can donate to nonprofits. You've got 100 democracy dollars for every American that they can put towards elections, so instead of waiting for Citizens United to be rolled over or turned over, uh, you want to add more money into the system. That would cost you $23 billion. You've got an American exchange program. You want to take high school seniors and have them travel to different parts of the country for six weeks. Uh, free marriage counseling for everyone. You want to increase teacher salaries and the, the sort of specifics you say you're going to work with the states on that. You want to create American journalism fellows. Uh, good for us, good for me. But that's going to cost a $6 billion fund to help that. And you want to attract people, as you were talking about, to dying malls and rethink how they could be used. How, how does all this get paid for? And this is one thing that I have to say, like I, I get very passionate about, is it's, it's incredible how successfully we've been brainwashed into thinking that we don't have the resources. Again, our economy is up to a record $20 trillion. We're the richest, most advanced economy in the history of the world. We can easily afford these things. What, what's happening right now is that uh, to the extent money is getting spent, it's getting caught up in various systems mm -hmm. uh, and bureaucracies that are not really delivering the benefits that the American people uh, expect, and that's one reason why we're getting so frustrated. Abortion's been in the news a lot recently as states are uh, uh, opting in to restrict it uh, until courts challenge this all. On your site, um, you say that basically uh, if men were getting pregnant, we wouldn't have restrictions on reproductive rights. You also say requirements placed by individual states on access should be subject to oversight by a board of doctors, not the whims of legislators. So how do you get to that vision of yours from where we are today? Well, as you can tell, I'm very pro women's reproductive rights. And as a male uh, legislator, I don't think it should be up to me what women do. Um, I would leave it, I would leave the room and let women decide. I have a feeling I know how women would come out. Uh, but the best way we can protect women's rights is to make sure that uh, Roe v. Wade remains the law of the land. And the best way to make that happen would be to have the Supreme Court reflect, in, in my mind, uh, the views of the American people. And right now, the Supreme Court's been politicized in a disastrous way. So there are a couple changes I would make. Number one is we should move away from lifetime appointments to 18-year terms, which would help depoliticize and make it less of a firestorm. By 18? Uh, well, that, that would, if you had nine uh, justices, then that would mean that you get an appointment every two years. It's fairly predictable. Each president gets two. Uh, but it's ridiculous that we're hyperventilating over uh, whether an 86-year-old woman gets a cold. Uh, you know, that's not a way a modern country uh, should operate. Uh, and then the second thing is that there's nothing in the Constitution about the number of justices on the Supreme Court. It's been lower than nine. It's been higher than nine. And other countries have had higher numbers in part so that when someone steps down, it's not as big a deal. Uh, on climate change, you say the federal government should support local efforts through funding and market-based incentives, meaning what? Well, right now, um, if there's a big company that uh, emits a lot of carbon into the, into the air, um, they're not really uh, internalizing that cost in economic terms. So the way we help monetize it is we have a carbon uh, fee and dividend. Not a tax. Well, I mean, you could call it a tax, you would call okay. it a fee. I mean, you know, it, it has the same effect. Um, but the point is that polluters should be internalizing the cost of their emissions, which then provides an incentive for them to reduce those emissions. And they can even innovate, get their emissions down, and then sell those credits um, to another company. The, those are the market mechanisms that would help us get emissions under control much more quickly. Okay. Uh, Immigration is another hot topic that we're thinking about and talking about a lot right now. Uh, you'd support the DREAM Act. You'd increase funding for border security and create a pathway to citizenship that would mean a new category of permanent resident who'd have to wait 18 years for citizenship, about the age that we, when we could vote, right? Why do you think Congress agrees to this versus the impasse that they've had for the last 20 years when they've tried to make different steps at uh, comprehensive immigration reform? Well, if you remember, there was a time when Marco Rubio was leading a bipartisan mm -hmm. effort that looked very much like uh, the proposal that I'm championing. And uh, then he lost a bit of political courage. He figured out that it would be bad for him politically. And then, you know, like then, then we never heard from it again. Uh, but most Americans agree that uh, this is a common sense approach that we need to pursue. Uh, if you have over 12 million undocumented immigrants in the U.S., which we do, it's completely ridiculous to suggest somehow that we're going to deport 12 million people. 
um, it's practically impossible. It would collapse regional economies. It would be uh, inhumane and separate families. Um, so we need to own the fact that there, these people are in our country, and we need to figure out a path forward for them. Uh, and again, Republicans were for this uh, before they started scapegoating immigrants to the extent they have recently. Mm -hmm. Uh, regarding China, you have talked repeatedly about figuring out a better relationship forward with them, about not seeing their gains as our losses. And at the same time, you also mentioned that their advantage in artificial intelligence is massive, the amount of data that they have access to, and they'll, that if we had a lead, they're catching up on that, if not going to pass that, us on that. They're also increasing right now their global influence uh, with dozens of countries through their Belt and Road Initiative at a time when the United States seems to be pulling back in, in how we uh, engage with the world. And you've got estimates, by some estimates right now, that on the western side of their country, you've got a million Uyghurs who are in re-education camps in 2019. So what are you willing to compromise to keep our T-shirts cheap? Well, I wouldn't, certainly wouldn't uh, simplify it to that extent. I mean, there were, there's a much more complex relationship than, than cheap T-shirts. Yeah. Um, but to me, the temptation is to view any... Um, rise in, in China's wealth and influence as somehow detrimental to American interests. That mm -hmm. would be something that America's ha kind of have a, um, Amer had a natural tendency um, in the past. And so if we head down that road, then we're going to wind up with a, certainly a trade war, as we're seeing now, mm -hmm. and potentially a Cold War, and maybe even worse over time. I mean, we have to see that China, China's development is historic in nature um, and does not necessarily mean that our uh, standard of living or our stature in the world is necessarily going to decline in an absolute way. Um, so the goal is to try and find the win-win where U.S.-China relationships are concerned. Uh, and I talked about, uh, you know, I talk about AI a fair amount. Like, we need to maintain a leadership position so that we can more effectively, frankly, like, be at the table so that China feels like they need to work with us. Uh, and so there is an element of focusing on our own competitiveness, uh, but there's also an element uh, in trying to avoid the zero-sum game that uh, would lead us to a Cold War with China. You know, there's this weird uh, factor that American voters have, which is, do I want to have a beer with the guy, or do I want to sit down and invite him into my home? Here you are traveling around the country now. What's your kind of elevator pitch to them? How do you introduce yourself? Oh, uh, you know, it's story? fun. I mean, I, I, I sit uh, with Americans uh, all over the country, and I'm not sure where I rate on the have a beer factor, um, but there are crowds of thousands of Americans coming out to our events and rallies. No, but considering there's 20 other candidates, how do you break through? Obviously, there's a, the policy proposal that's pretty exciting right now, but how do you introduce yourself as a person that they can connect with? Well, that's one of the fun parts of this process, just introducing myself to more Americans. You know, what are the values that drive that. you? Where did you come from? You know what I mean? How, what, what, what's the kind of thing that say, okay, I, I, I trust this guy. I've looked him in the eye. I've shook his hands. I got it. Uh, you know what's fun is I actually think I'm introducing myself through the policies and through the problem-solving approach. Is that Americans at this point have lost patience uh, with a political narrative of symbols and anger and um, cults of personality. Like they're more interested in how to solve the problems of the day. And when they see someone focused on solving those problems, to many Americans, that's a breath of fresh air. Andrew Yang, thanks so much. Thanks. It's great to be here with you.